There are two approaches to regional development, exogenous regional development and endogenous regional development. The endogenous approach is based on the resources of each particular area. It uses techniques created through local traditions and culture, and the region itself leads the way. On the other hand, exogenous development introduces capital and resources from outside the region in order to promote industries. This development template focuses on attracting large-scale plants for shipping, automobiles, electrical equipment, and others. There is a third approach which combines these two patterns. Following the Second World War, Japan used the exogenous approach to consolidate the existing four major industrial areas of Keihin, Hanshin, Chukyo, and Kitakyushu. Meanwhile, new industrial areas were created and developed in the coastal and inland regions. Economic growth was centered on heavy and chemical industries such as steel, petrochemicals, and machinery. The government aimed to use land equitably in order to achieve balanced regional development. This was achieved through large-scale project development of heavy and chemical industries and through the nationwide upgrading of the transport and communication networks. This is a graph of Japan's economic growth. Average yearly growth from the mid-1950s to the early 1970s was more than 10%. This period of high economic growth led to Japan becoming the world's second largest economy. The exogenous approach was used to promote large-scale development projects in the heavy and chemical industries. This led to economic growth. Meanwhile, public investment and grants were used for regional improvement in rural areas. This aimed to ease excessive concentration in large urban areas and counteract regional disparities. However, this kind of rapid economic growth had serious side effects. Pollution. Poor living environment by overpopulation or depopulation. Destruction of the natural environment and traditional culture. Decline in rural vitality and strong dependency on government. Hollowing out of small towns. Such rapid growth caused a variety of problems. In Japan, mercury in factory wastewater caused Minamata disease. Cadmium from metal mines caused Itaitai -itai disease. Air pollution from petrochemical complexes caused Yokaichi asthma. The appearance of these and other serious pollution-related diseases led to a number of lawsuits. This graph shows the demographic shift of rural and urban areas. As people seek employment, they move from rural to urban areas. This trend rose to a peak in 1961 at the start of high economic growth. This rapid demographic shift has led to underpopulation in rural areas and overpopulation in urban areas. As this trend continued in rural areas, industries declined in regions dependent on underproductive agriculture, forestry, and fishing. Areas which had lost their economic vitality now faced the problem of community collapse. The government responded to these problems. It strengthened regulations on pollution control and environmental protection. This alleviated some of the problems of exogenous regional development. However, although public funding and grants were used to revitalize depopulated rural areas, this was not enough. The 
What resolved the issue was endogenous regional development undertaken by the leadership of the areas themselves. So what is the endogenous regional development approach? It is opposite from the exogenous regional development, which relies on outside capital and resources. It was developed in recognition of several problems related to the exogenous approach. For example, although investors will use a region when it suits them, if circumstances change, such as in an economic downturn, they will abandon the idea. As a result, several regions not only saw zero growth, but actually experienced deprivation. The endogenous approach is presented in this chart. Local residents who face the problems of population migration and community breakdown use the resources available locally the local environment, culture, tradition, skills, history, and nature. They create or regenerate new local industries. They aim for cycles of regional economic activity. They also maintain and restore the local environment. And they work to develop the region. The local people, residents, local governments, and business enterprises all share ownership of the region. They cooperate with outsiders, and they use their creativity to revitalize the region. The whole process helps create effective local manpower and leads to sustainable development. A number of progressive communities devised the endogenous regional development approach by learning through trial and error. Let's take a look at some examples. Kyushu is a large island in southwest Japan. Oyama is a village in the northeast of Kyushu, in Oita Prefecture. Let's see how Oyama has worked to escape poverty by promoting agriculture. Oyama is a small village surrounded by mountains. Six thousand plum trees stand on about three hundred thousand square meters of land on the slopes between mountains. Japanese are fond of plum trees. They bloom before the cherry blossoms to mark the coming of spring. Not only is the blossom beautiful and fragrant, but the fruit has been used for centuries as medicine to prevent food poisoning and to treat parasites. Umeboshi, a pickled plum, is a staple feature of traditional Japanese breakfast. Oyama's plum trees symbolize agricultural promotion involving the whole village, from local agricultural cooperatives to residents. In 1960, there were 58 municipalities in Oita, but Oyama had the lowest farming income of all. Although 80% of its residents were farmers, their produce wasn't profitable. The village was extremely poor. In 1961, the entire village decided to try an experiment, which could earn them money throughout the year. Small rice paddies and fields were turned into plum and chestnut fields, letting residents harvest plums in the spring and chestnuts in the autumn. The movement was called NPC, New Plum and Chestnuts. Bring us the good life. This was the motto of Harumi Yahata, Oyama's then mayor and head of the local agricultural cooperative. 
One more step will bring us the life of the elite. The catchphrase for the campaign was plant plums and chestnuts to make enough for a trip to Hawaii. Under the direction of the agricultural cooperative, crops that suited the local region were produced. As a result, the income of farming families increased. The village realized its goal of a trip to Hawaii. Oyama had a higher percentage of passport holders than any other town in Japan. We had far fewer financial resources, but we used nearly the entire budget on plums and chestnuts. The local government even paid for the saplings, for fertilizer, and for heavy machinery to break the ground for fields. The local government also provided staff to help guide all of the farming families. I myself was a member of the staff, and I worked morning till night without any extra overtime pay. We had the full support of the government. Everybody came together. We were united in the desire to change Oyama. We had only a third or a fifth of the land area of other regions, so we couldn't use land area to generate wealth. Instead, we decided to rotate crops in a smaller area. If you rotate crops ten times a year, you only need a tenth of the land to keep up with other places. We boosted our local economy with plum trees and chestnuts, but you can only harvest them once a year. We took note of that pretty fast and thought about other ways to use the land. The village quickly expanded crops to include prunes and enoki mushrooms. The first NPC campaign helped raise income but depopulation continued as before. Residents still felt their life had not been sufficiently enriched. So in 1965, a second NPC campaign began. The title was changed to Neo-Personality Combination. Its aim was to cultivate local residents with rich minds, education, and understanding. It developed leaders through inspection tours to Israeli kibbutzes, domestic and overseas training trips, and the promotion of social awareness and exchange events. Over 100 people under 65 in this village were trained under the program. However, young people continued to leave for urban areas. In 1969, the NPC campaign entered its third stage, with the aim of creating a village which appealed to the younger generation. NPC now stood for New Paradise Community. In order to provide better access to information, a cable television network was set up. The community made its own programs and local residents were able to share the same information without delay. Oyama was able to create an environment which encompassed culture, entertainment, and education. It has continued to develop with three main focuses, 
work, learning, and love. Initially, the special local products were plums and chestnuts. Now there are 130 items. This is the Konohana Garden at Oyama Outlet directly managed by the Agricultural Cooperative. It opened in 1990 with the motto, Local Production for Local Consumption. It is run by the Agricultural Cooperative and local farming families. The products are packaged and priced by their producers who bring them into the store. The price tag shows the name of the producer. Local farmers are naturally more motivated now that the quality and pricing of their goods is directly linked to sales. In 2002, a buffet-style restaurant opened next to the outlet. It serves food made from locally grown ingredients, prepared by local farmers' wives. The restaurant now has 1.9 million visitors a year. The connection between crop and consumer, that link is all about mutual trust. You can't create that overnight. It's a relationship that's grown over 40 or 50 years. I don't think that these consumers buy products. They're buying a part of the Oyama farmer spirit. Oyama succeeded in boosting its local economy by focusing on agricultural promotion. Oyama recreated itself from Japan's poorest village to its wealthiest village. The NPC programs helped residents steadily overcome each challenge they faced in order to revitalize the community. This involved producing crops which suited the area, processing those crops to create high value added products, strengthening human resources, creating new environments, and also establishing sales routes through creative ideas such as the Konohana Garden. Under the leadership of the mayor, the village agricultural cooperative and local farmers all united to restore Oyama's vitality. It is a testament to their productivity, education, and love. Oyama's ideas eventually spread throughout the entire prefecture. In 1979, Oita Prefecture began the One Village, One Product movement. Different communities developed their own specialty products to compete on a national level. Once a year, there is a gubernatorial conference involving the people of 11 towns and 47 village leaders. When I became governor, I told everyone that the meeting that each community should produce its own special product. If a product was good, I would go to Tokyo to promote it. That was the start of the movement. There are three key phrases in the movement. The first is local but global. Although we're talking about regional specialties from Oita Prefecture, they must be products which will work in the national or international market. The second is self-reliance and creativity. The national government offers loans, but not grants. The prefectural government offers technical guidance, but as in Oyama, the product development has to be done by the village itself.
The third is the most important, developing human resources. If you want to create a high-value added product, you need people who have a grasp of international markets, not farmers who grow rice, wheat and vegetables the way we've always done. Think globally, act locally is the motto of Oita's One Village, One Product movement. The movement generated 840 success stories in 2002. Hiramatsu sees common denominators in these successes. Raising local awareness, recognizing unique local treasures, understanding the power of continuity, making high value added products, establishing sales routes, and developing human resources. Local areas provide information and products. The movement is spreading from Aoyama to Oita, to all parts of Japan, and now to the world. Another town in Oita Prefecture revitalized itself by increasing the demand for tourism. A land of volcanoes, Japan has many hot springs. Visiting a hot spring resort is a popular holiday break for many Japanese, and there are many possible destinations. Yufuin in Oita Prefecture is one of Japan's most popular hot spring resorts. The beautiful natural landscape and serene traditional town attracts a lot of people. Yufuin was designated a National Hot Spring Health Resort in 1959. But back then, it was overshadowed by Beppu, one of Japan's top hot spring resorts. Yufuin had few inns and few visitors. The town was deserted. Leading Yufuin's economic boost was Kumpei Misuguchi of Tamanoyu, a Japanese inn. We did have a hot spring, but there was nothing distinctive about it, so nobody came. If we had tried to do the same things as Beppu, which was popular, we'd just have been the second or third runner-up. I really felt we shouldn't turn into a smaller version of Beppu. We shouldn't copy it. We went for the total opposite. Beppu is known for its nightlife, large size, and male visitors. So we decided Yufuin should focus on women, health, relaxation, and small groups. In 1971, Mizoguchi and two other young people concerned about Yufuin's future borrowed money from an agricultural cooperative and went to a study tour to the German health resort Baden Beiler. They found a direction for Yufuin in the resort's peaceful green streets and the rest cure style. We looked at absolutely everything. The reports we wrote still feel fresh today. The things we thought about 40 years ago have now become a reality. I'm just so pleased we've kept proper written records. Mizuguchi's inn is called Yufuin Tamanoyu. Surrounded by trees, it perfectly embodies his image of Yufuin an inn where one can quietly rest amid serene surroundings. In 1975, an earthquake hit the central part of Oita, 
Although Yufuin did not suffer much damage, a rumor that it had been destroyed led to a sharp decline in visitors. The residents banded together to tackle this problem. They decided to publicize that it was free from damage by running horse-drawn carriages. They also organized cultural events such as film and music festivals. City dwellers offered funding for raising cattle. This movement was named Protecting Ranches by Becoming a Cow Owner. This later developed into a beef-eating shouting contest in which the owners are invited to a barbecue in the meadows and compete in a shouting contest. Such events proved popular, and by updating them annually, Yufuin was able to advertise itself and stay in the public eye. By holding all these events, we attracted people from across the country. The attention to culture and the arts, instead of just tourism, gave Yufuin the special flavor we wanted. When you welcome guests from elsewhere, it's all about how to care for them, what we can do for them. If someone has read up on the town before coming, you need to make sure that you know at least as much as they do. And that's how you continue to reach more people. Yufuin's mayors have always supported the efforts of local people. After the Oita earthquake, the local administration made new bylaws to help the hotel and tourism workers who were promoting the town. The first was the ordinance for the preservation of the natural environment to protect Yufuin's natural surroundings. This helped to deter large-scale development. Then, the ordinance for preservation of the living environment was enacted, which included building height restrictions. With these two ordinances, the government supported town development. Since starting the music and film festivals, awareness has grown among local administrators that they're also taking part in local development. It's important that they feel united with the residents and want to work with them. In Yufuin, local officials and ordinary residents share the same goal. They work together to make the healing hometown of their dreams. It's important that the people who live in the town are happy. How do you discover, research, and develop the beauty of a region in order to achieve that? Adopting the strategies of other places won't allow things to take root. You have to find something precious about the place where you live and cultivate it.
みたいなね、えー、なんか魅力よそにないものをどう発見し作っていくかっていうねそしてそれをみんなで育てていくという、ね、ことそれとまあユフィンはそういうような小さなところでしたけどね How do local people show kindness to visitors? How do you cultivate a welcoming community spirit? You have to raise residents' awareness. So, you have to travel with them and teach them. There must be a constant flow of new people, new culture. Fresh breezes. The help of local and national governments. Is also vital. They can create opportunities for fresh breezes from the outside to interact with endogenous development. That kind of discovery and cultivation is important. Yufuin now has nearly 4 million visitors a year and is the number one hot spring resort that Japanese want to visit. With Misoguchi and his young colleagues driving the regeneration, local officials and residents have united in the belief that a town which is comfortable to live in provides the best tourist destination. They saw local resources not just in the hot spring, but in the rural landscape, nature, and Yufuin's tranquility. Local residents appealed to visitors with imaginative events and heartfelt hospitality. Their work has also helped cultivate skills among the next generation. Gifu Prefecture is in the middle of Japan's largest main island. Here in Meiho, the residents and local government united to start new businesses, to encourage tourism and develop specialty products. Meiho lies at the foot of a range of mountains. Its core industries used to be forestry, silkworm breeding, and animal husbandry. However, from the 1970s, partly due to mine closures, depopulation and the aging of population started. The village was in danger of losing its identity as an autonomous community. An expressway created better access, and in 1985, Meiho began developing tourism to boost its economy. Residents and administrators united to establish a string of third sector firms focusing on ski facilities, hot springs, and local specialty products. Developing a village means developing its people. We spent so many local government sessions discussing a ski resort. Hot spring resort, development of specialty products, and the people who would head these projects. Meho has seven districts, and we conducted face to face discussions with all of them to make sure everyone understood what was happening. It was hugely important that we got all the residents on board. One of the five third sector firms was established in 1992, Meho Ladies. This firm makes ketchup from local specialty tomatoes. The company's appeal was the original local recipe, which used no additives, and the care put into each jar of handmade ketchup. The flavor was a hit, as was their mail order business. 
With over 280,000 jars sold a year, the ketchup is now shipped to department stores in major cities. As the name suggests, everyone who works at Mayho Ladies is female. Before joining, all of them, including the CEO, were local farmers' wives. We started out as a quality of life improvement group. When we first became a firm, I was worried about whether we'd really have work to do. But the local government provided support and all these ideas about what we could do. It took us six years to produce a flavor we were really happy with. We got advice from the staff at the Extension Center. If you look at the firm from a regional employment perspective, everyone who works here is a local woman. So you could say that the village is what created this company. Meho has cured ham since the 1950s, and that tradition too is handled by a third sector firm. Meho Specialty Product Processing Corp. Meho Ham was established in 1988. The firm uses only the best meat, fresh pork leg from Japanese livestock. Including the painstaking job of carving out the meat, 4,000 Meho hams are produced every day. The sales activity, led by the residents and local government, worked well, and the ham is now one of the area's leading hit products. The five third sector firms are teammates, like a rugby scrum, where we all hold on tightly to one another. The village had no money, so the local government couldn't run the firms. We residents got together to start them, and the local government lent us a hand. I think we probably had the first third sector firms in the country. This traditional looking Japanese building with a parking lot is Michinoeki Road Station. It's being built along national roads in accordance with government regulations. There are over 800 road stations in Japan. They offer more than being just places where drivers can rest. They are sources of local tourist information and welcome large numbers of people. As such, they play a role in boosting the local economy. They also serve an important role as a strategic local base. Meiho uses this road station as a base for selling those local specialties, tomato ketchup and ham. What is the purpose of development? The most important thing is to have a clear goal and a robust plan. It's vital to do things using an approach that local residents understand. All of the five third sector firms have continued to make a profit. Meho has created employment opportunities, raised incomes, and stopped depopulation. It achieved this through its residents and local government working together through local companies, and by establishing unique firms which take advantage of regional resources. The companies are now moving towards private sector management. Ikeda is a town in the Tokachi Plain in eastern Hokkaido, Japan's northernmost main island. Let's see how the strong leadership of the mayor led to success in industrial development. Ikeda is one of Japan's coldest regions. This is the railway station, an enormous artwork 
a wine bottle and corkscrew greets visitors. The town is known for its successful economic regeneration. This was based on its development of Japan's first municipal winery. There are countless signboards based on wine and grapes. Even the local taxi firm is known as Wine Taxis. This medieval-style castle on a small hill in the town houses the Tokachi Ikeda Research Institute for Viticulture and Enology. Its nickname is Wine Castle. It's a top tourist attraction with over 250,000 visitors a year. Here they can observe the wine production process. The cellars are underground. Wine ages here in barrels imported from France and Italy. This is the bottling process. Everything is mechanized, and 1,000 kiloliters are produced every year under strict hygienic control. Sales reach nearly a billion yen a year. At the end of the tour, there's free wine tasting. Many visitors buy wine to take home. But why did Ikeda decide to make wine? A major earthquake in 1952 was followed by two years of severe cold. Ikeda's core industry, farming, was ruined. The town was in serious financial trouble. The mayor at the time turned to grapes, known to be resistant to cold and harvest failure. He pushed hard for winemaking. We had lots of wild grapes growing on the mountains around Ikeda. As part of our agricultural policy, I wondered if we could grow grapes on unused land. Human beings can't create life itself, but we can help it evolve into something else. I knew we could grow wild grapes in our fields. The town decided to make wine using wild Iketa grapes. But the town officials, including the mayor, were complete beginners. None of them knew anything about wine or winemaking techniques. They had to overcome countless problems. The national government said it wouldn't give us a grant because we were bound to fail. We were turned down by everyone, from the Ministry of Agriculture to universities. We were laughed at by local farming villages, and no matter how many vines we planted, they all died. The first wine Ikeda made had mold floating in the glass. The wine was impossible to drink. However, there was another major problem. Commercial production of wine required a stable supply of grapes. But Ikeda's average annual temperature is 6 degrees Celsius, plunging to minus 20 in the winter. They couldn't make grapes grow in those temperatures. I sent the man with the strongest head for alcohol on a year-long trip to study wine. I told him not to come home until he knew how to make it. Under orders from Mayor Marutani, the staff members sent to Germany lived with a farming family and studied grape growing and winemaking. 
Germany grows a lot of grapes in similar temperatures to those in Hokkaido. The key lay in the height of the branches. The branches are groomed to lie just 40 centimeters above the ground. This allows the warmth of the field to help prevent the vines withering in the cold. Ikeda adopted this method, which doesn't require building special structures. Ikeda also acquired the yeast vital to making wine. In 1964, the town's passion for wine finally bore fruit. Ikeda entered a sample wine in an international wine competition in Bulgaria. It took the bronze medal. Progress was also being made in the selective breeding of grapes. A mutation is said to occur in one in a thousand vines, so workers continued to cultivate vines with the hope of finding useful mutations. Eventually, they discovered the perfect grape for the Ikeda soil. The specialized research was organized and carried out by the local government. It couldn't really be done by the farmers. In 1967, eight years after first attempting to grow grapes, wine from Japan's first municipal winery went on sale. Three years later, in 1970, it developed its own unique variety, Kiyomi. It then asked local farmers to start growing Kiyomi, and they responded. The town's residents became proud of their local wine, and the foundation for making wine was now complete. Ikeda's symbolic wine castle opened in 1974. The success of Ikeda wine even changed the awareness of local cattle farmers. There were 5,000 head of cattle in the town, owned by 500 farming families. But none of them had ever eaten beef. So we started offering local mothers classes in cooking beef. That started everyone eating it. And I thought, we could open up a restaurant. The Wine Castle's restaurant now features a popular menu focused on local ingredients, including steak. Meanwhile, a wine festival was started in the plaza next door to the wine castle. Visitors can enjoy wine with barbecued beef and local vegetables. And concerts are also held there. It's a popular event which attracts crowds of tourists from around Japan every year. The mayor proposed municipal winemaking as a last resort to revive agriculture in Ikeda. This has had an enormous effect on reviving and developing the local economy. We had a hunger to succeed. The ideal is to be able to make a living off of your own surroundings. That helps you think about the basic questions. What can you use around you? What can you achieve in this place? What did your predecessors do here? You have to have faith in your hometown. I think you need to fall in love with the place you live. Ikeda was revived thanks to the leadership of its mayor. The success of the municipal grape growing and winemaking made a big impact on local crop and cattle farmers and created a regional cycle of economic activity. Ikeda is now known across Japan as a winemaking town. 
Residents are proud of their town, and tourists flock to the wine castle at the wine festival. Asuke is a town in central Japan. It's part of Toyota City in Aichi Prefecture, and it's known for its beautiful autumn foliage. Visitors flock to the town during the autumn to view the leaves. But this foliage isn't part of the natural heritage of this locality. The first maple was planted here in 1624, and another major planting took place in 1923. Since then, the maple forest has continued to spread and is now named Koranke. Asuke first flourished as a center for the distribution of goods. A new project was launched to attract year-round tourists to the historic town, the beautiful landscape, and traditional handcrafts and lifestyles. The tourism facility, Sanchu Asuke Yashiki, opened in 1980. It was a reconstruction of a mid-19th century farmhouse, complete with main building, warehouse, and gatehouse. It used local building materials and was built by local carpenters and craftsmen. The sound of cattle and chickens, the turning water wheel, and the fire of an open hearth. All the hands-on crafts necessary in a mountain town are recreated here. Charcoal burning, paper making, weaving. The concept for the facility was developed by Shoichi Ozawa. A senior official at the time, he is now head of the local tourist association. We used to have all the industries we needed to survive in the town itself, whether it was a blacksmith or a charcoal burner. Aske was once self-sufficient, and we brought back all the old traditional jobs. Getting a glimpse of the past is a glimpse of something beautiful. It's a chance to re-examine your view of the area. Many of the craftsmen displaying their skills are over 60 years old. They captivate visitors with hands-on skills that have been developed through their daily life. Conversations with visitors also provides them with vitality towards their work. Tea leaves are steamed in an enormous barrel. This impressive method is the traditional way of making tea in the region. I feel like I've come back home. It feels so serene. It's a slice of history. It's human interactions which keep a region alive. That's the most important strategy for revitalizing areas which are losing their population. To develop an area, you need strangers, fools, and the young. It's important to create a town which welcomes outsiders. At one time, all the core staff at Aske Yashiki were from around here, but now they're from all over Japan, and they help keep the place new. Fools are great because they will do a task thoroughly. That makes them popular around here. We like fools. And we really have to focus on communication with young people. We want to be a region with plenty of young people, and we all get along well with outsiders. 
The Sanju Asuke Yashiki doesn't just maintain the region's traditional culture. The craftsmen who work here have secure work which is both fulfilling and offers a steady income. The success of Sanju Asuke Yashiki lies in its re-examination of the basis of welfare for the elderly. It asked itself, what do we need to stay mentally and emotionally satisfied in old age? Asuke put into practice a new welfare plan for the elderly in 1990. It took the form of the welfare center Hyakunen So. The center serves as a regional health and welfare base for local residents. It also features a chic hotel and restaurant. This is as a base for exchange where tourists are welcomed. The restaurant serves food which uses ingredients grown by elderly local residents. We wanted something different from a conventional welfare facility. In places like that, old people come along and get looked after by helpers who then go home. We built a place where the elderly play a central role. I think it's good to have a facility where once a month people can have a Western meal with knife and fork and be served red wine. You can't get by on mountain vegetables alone. The concept was to have some place nearby where you could enjoy other kinds of food. The facility includes motivational shops, which sell ham, sausages and bread made by the elderly. This is the Gigi workshop, where processed meat such as ham and sausages are made. Gigi is a Japanese word meaning old man. People who retire after working in neighboring factories come here to make ham. It's become a precious employment opportunity for the elderly. We didn't have a single pig in Aske, not one. We were going to make something new. We thought about something easy, but of good quality, for elderly people to make, and came up with ham. And there's also a bakery called Babara House in the facility. This is a play on the word Baba, old woman in Japanese. All the bread and waffles sold here are handmade by local people. Not all of them are elderly. There are young people who work with them to make bread. The products are popular not only with tourists, but also with local residents. In mountain villages, it's essential for the local government to take the lead. The residents have enough on their plates with their immediate problems. They don't have time to think about developing the town. That's why it's necessary for the local government to set their sights firmly on the future and decide on a direction. If you're going to focus on welfare, it can't just be any old thing. We built this facility to provide something that broke the mold, something cheerful and vital. Asuke has turned a profit by building a place where the elderly can work and have fun. This is in addition to traditional welfare services such as daycare and rehabilitation. Where did the momentum for this idea come from? We were lucky to be poor. We had all the more to accomplish. What seems to be negative isn't always negative. Our staff thought for themselves, did all the footwork themselves, and that helped them forge connections. That network is a personal treasure for them. 
as well as for the town. That's what matters. Asuke created a business from the service combining the elements of welfare, cultural education, tourism, and residential life. It developed a way to resolve regional problems while also raising incomes. Collaboration between the local government and the people helped to motivate everyone in the area. The elderly are not simply there to be assisted, but play an active role as part of the area's human resources. The keys to success were found in the presence of a creative local official who came up with such an idea with a good understanding of the regional resources available, while also incorporating outsiders and creating a local economic cycle by utilizing them. This is how Asuke became a tourist destination with over two million visitors. The area has been re-energized. As you can see from these examples, the work of local people is the key to endogenous regional development and community vitality. It's achieved through an understanding of local resources, being creative while protecting the natural environment, and establishing new industries and regional economic cycles. Social and economic progress is achieved over many years through cooperation between local officials and residents. A constant process of trial and error helps to solve each problem. The people in these regions turned away from closed, exclusive policies. Every example shares common traits. Listening to outside opinions, investigating other examples in Japan and abroad, and always being serious about learning. The local specialty products they produced are sold in distant markets, but are also consumed locally. This mechanism helps attract visitors and interaction with a large number of people adds fresh vitality. Every area faced difficult conditions. However, the minimum requirements to overcome these challenges, such as road access, were made available through public works, subsidies, and grants. So it is important not to overlook the role played by the central government. These examples all began with strong leadership. However, a variety of activities empowered all the local residents. They have increased their organizational strength. This is a perfect example of regional capacity development. The residents' work continues today. They move towards a goal that may be 50 or even 100 years in the future. Japanese village revitalization continues moving forward with the cooperation of residents, corporations, government, and NGOs under strong leadership. These are villages and towns across Japan where residents enjoy a happy, fulfilling life. <laughs>